السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد الهادي الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear brothers and sisters Yesterday we spoke about the ikhlas and the importance of the good deeds having the ikhlas inside it and we said that Imam ibn Ata'illah rahimahullah ta'ala taught us that the a'mal al-saliha, the good deeds like bodies and must have a soul inside it and the soul of it is the ikhlas, the sincerity. So for us as a, as a believers what we have to do, we have to make sure that to maintain both together, to perform a good amal for Allah and to make sure to have the ikhlas for Allah. The good amal is external side, that's you perfect your salah, you perfect your amal, you do for Allah any type of good deeds, either with Allah or with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the meantime, the heart has to be there, the ikhlas for Allah. And the ikhlas is, the place of the ikhlas is inside the heart, back again to the heart, because everything is relied on this heart. So the ikhlas is in the heart, which means you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking his pleasure and nothing else so you need your reward from Allah and from no one else so when you do the amal for Allah and you put the soul of that amal then this amal becomes alive when this amal is alive that means this amal is active which means the amal becomes stronger then the amal will benefit you every ibadah that Allah made in this life has a certain amount of blessings you will never be able to receive the secrets and the blessings of your ibadah until you fill it up with the ikhlas, with the sincerity. The moment you per perfect your amal, you make the itqan, and then you fill it up with the ikhlas, the sincerity, then at that time get ready to receive. So now your ibadah now will feed you. Your ibadah now will help you. Your ibadah now will support you. You will receive the secrets and the barakah of your ibadah. But if you perform the ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only externally, but there is no soul inside it, there is no ikhlas, there is no sincerity, and there is no itqan, that means this ibadah, it's like dead body. You cannot benefit from it in the dunya rather than benefiting from it in the hereafter. The ikhlas, my dear brothers and sisters, is not a temporary thing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ikhlas is, is, is your hayah. The ikhlas is not something that you use during performing the ibadah only. So we done it from the ibadah side that every ibadah we do for Allah must have the ikhlas, the sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about outside the ibadah, outside the salah and the siyam? Do I have to have ikhlas for Allah? The answer yes, because the ikhlas is part of your life. You cannot separate between your life as a believer and a lover of Allah and the ikhlas and the sincerity of Allah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said in the Quran, uh, uh, They have not been commanded by Allah and requested, but to worship Allah له الدين, with the ikhlas, sincerity. In what? In the deen, in the whole deen. So that means the ikhlas, it must be with the deen, our deen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the deen in the other ayah? Allah said, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So the deen is everything in your life. Your salah is your deen. Uh, your your ibadah is your deen, uh, your life is your deen, your your daily work and, 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 and routine life is your deen as well. Uh, as a believer, every single thing and every single moment in your life is your deen, which means you must have the ikhlas for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every single thing in your life. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ My life, وَمَمَاتِي and my death even. What about them? Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. They all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Which means I have one qibla all my life. Everything I do, it must go to one direction, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't have any other direction in my life. My qibla is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I do is for Allah and seeking his pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the relation between the lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only, and you must, you must understand this very important, your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a beloved, as a, as a aashiq of Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only on the prayer mat. 
So when you perform the prayer, when you have the prayer mat there, you are with Allah. And then the moment you finish, then you take the prayer mat and then you're done. Then see you later. Then no more connection with Allah. That's not how it works. So remember this. My relationship with Allah is not only on the prayer mats. My relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in every single corner of my life. In every moment, in everything I do, in everything I say, in everything I think about, everything I feel is all about Allah. Why? Because this is the ihsan. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara. What Allah wants from you, Allah always wants to give you the best of what he has and all what he has is best and amazing. Allah wants to elevate you to the highest level, which is the level of al-ihsan. When you get to that level, then you will what? You will be among the people of al-ihsan. And Allah says in the Quran, wallahu يحب المحسنين and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people of al-ihsan may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the people of al-ihsan in this dunya and the akhirah Allahumma ameen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh please take the wonderful opportunity this one to sponsor the Noon Academy of Dar program please contact us for details thank you a point that's made by Harali in his commentary on the names of the Prophet ﷺ. Harali being a 13th century uh, uh, scholar from Marrakesh who's buried in Hems in Syria. <inaudible> Repel evil by that which is better. This is a verse that accords with the merciful nature of the Nabi ﷺ. Dispute not with the people of the book except in the most virtuous manner. Or the verse, خُذِ الْعَفُوا وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Take to pardoning and enjoin right and turn away from the ignorant. Maintain the ties of kinship, in other words, with one who would cut himself off from you and give to the one who withholds from you and pardon the one who wrongs you. These are the implications of this mercy, uh, this verse of mercy. Another verse: "Walau kunta fadhan ghalib al qalbi lan fadhu min haulika fafu anhum wa staghfir lahum wa shawirhum fil amr." Had you been severe, fadh, and hard-hearted, ghalib al qalb, they would have scattered from about you. So pardon them, ask forgiveness for them, wa staghfir lahum. And consult them in affairs. Fasfahi safha al jamil. Forbear with a few beautiful forbearance in the face of hostility that you face, Ya Rasulullah in Mecca and in Medina, the ridicule, the mockery, the treachery, the hardship. Fasfahi safha al jamil. Forbear with a beautiful forbearance. These verses are impregnated with Allah Ta'ala's mercy that's embodied in the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam. And they're folded, all of these verses of the Qur'an that speak of the mercy of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasalam, they're enfolded within لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنَ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم. The last two verses of Surah At-Tawbah, a surah that doesn't even begin with the Basmala, with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It doesn't begin with the names of Allah, the All Merciful, the Ever Merciful, but ends with لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ. A messenger has indeed come unto you from among your own. A surah describing hypocrisy and treachery and mockery. 
and unbelief and rejection of prophecy. Surah At-Tawbah, Bara'atun min Allah. That surah ends with laqad ja'akum. A messenger has indeed come unto you from among your own. Troubled is he by what you suffer. Solicitous of you, kind and merciful unto the believers. According to some commentators, this is possibly the very last verse revealed to us in the Quran. Though the Prophet ﷺ, before his death, right before his death, this verse was revealed that we may contemplate it, that we may contemplate the mercy of an Nabi ﷺ. Now, in contrast to these Quranic descriptions of divine mercy, Prophetic mercy is described in a way that is mixed with a certain painful empathy which affects him because of his human nature. And verses of mercy were congruent or compatible with the book, with the Nabi ﷺ, with his innate disposition and he accepted them in his state, in his actions without a pause. Because the two were enmeshed. The essence of the revelation, the wasiyya of the revelation, concords with the essence of the Prophet of Mercy. Other parts of the Quran descend in accordance with justice, with recompense, with vengeance, with a Nabi وسلم, as community builder, as head of state. And these go against the innate disposition of mercy of the Prophet وسلم, in a certain sense. And in these cases, he would await and anticipate a lightning of the verse, takhfif, a lightning of ikrah, a lightning of the compulsion that's entailed and implied in these verses. And so the verses of severity he found heavier. In a similar manner, the verses that are severe toward him, alayhi salatu salam, where Allah ta'ala azza wa jal reproaches his beloved one, are themselves the greatest verses or ayat of, of praise and laudation of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Perhaps you would destroy yourself with grief for this for their sake, should they not believe in this account. In other words, will you exhaust yourself with concern and sadness on their account? And Allah Azza wa Jal says we know well that what they say grieves you, yet it is not that they deny, rather it is the signs of Allah Ta'ala that the wrongdoers reject. And you see in these verses of reproach uh, a certain uh, ikrah, you might say, or compulsion or pushing of Nabi al-Rahmah, the Prophet of Mercy, to push him toward the side of justice, the side of malhama, of revenge, and of severity in order to impose order. And that is one of the ways in which the Qur'an praises and highlights the mercy of an Nabi alayhi salatu salam, bearing testimony to the fact that his heart is aligned with the core of revelation, that he has fully realized Nabi al-Rahmah, just as Allah Ta'ala is innately merciful, and just as Mercy is one of the innate or essential attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Qadi Iyad, one of the great uh, lovers of an Nabi alayhi salatu salam, and one of the great scholars of hadith who wrote Kitab al-Shifa, the antidote to identify Hukuq al-Mustafa, the rights of the chosen one. In the Kitab al-Shifa, he notes that some scholars point out that the verse وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى from Surah Al-Duha that was revealed after a long period of silence where he did not receive revelation in the early Meccan period. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Surely your Lord will give you or will give unto you and you will be content. Qad Iyad notes that this is the most hopeful, most optimistic most joyous and celebratory verse in the Qur'an. Because when you think about it, he alayhi salatu salam, who is the supreme effusion and the spring source of divine mercy, would be content with nothing short of his ummah and beyond 
to enter into divine forgiveness and bliss. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِ سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ كَمَا صَلَّيْتَ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا إِبْرَاهِيمٍ وَعَلَى آلِ سَيِّدِنَا إِبْرَاهِيمٍ وَبَارِكْ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِ سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ كَمَا بَارَكْتَ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا إِبْرَاهِيمٍ وَعَلَى آلِ سَيِّدِنَا إِبْرَاهِيمٍ فِي الْعَالَمِينَ إِنَّكَ حَمِيدٌ مَجِيدٌ اللهم صل على الذات المصطفاوية والفيضة الرحمانية سيدنا محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام We pray for a blessed Ramadan We pray, pray for a merciful Ramadan We pray for a sincere Ramadan We pray for a Ramadan of increased love for Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam through whom the revelation descended the Ramadan of the Quran Allahumma laka alhamd Allahumma laka al-shukr الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسول ربنا بالحق اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome back to another youth segment بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم I want to start by mentioning an ayah from the Quran that we all know and love in Surah Al-Furqan where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by mentioning his beautiful servants when he says that he starts off by saying that his beautiful servants the ibad of Ar-Rahman of the merciful they when they walk on this earth when they walk on this planet they walk with ease they don't walk with arrogance they walk with subtlety they walk relaxed they don't walk like they're better than others. They don't stop on the ground harshly. And while they're walking and they come up across some type of people that are ignorant, some type of people that are not knowing and they say some remarks to them that are obviously rude or not well thought. How do they address these ignorant people? They don't address them with ignorance back. They don't address them with harshness in return. Rather, they address them with salama, as the Prophet ﷺ taught us to with the people that we encounter, good or bad. That وَعِبَادُ rahman those special people, those special servants of Ar-Rahman, when they are walking the earth, first of all, they're already walking in peace. They're walking nicely. They're not walking this earth with something to prove. And even if they come across someone who doesn't know what they're doing and they say something, ignorant to them and they bother them they don't let it get to them they don't let it get to their heart they don't let it get to their head and then they don't respond in a way that is ignorant as well rather they respond with salam they respond with peace and love to make them think like wait a minute what am I doing like imagine how confusing that is for an ignorant person to respond or act ignorantly to someone and then get a response of peace and salam it'll confuse them it'll leave them baffled that's why a lot of the times you hear that the best response is either no response at all or a response that is better or positive. As the Prophet ﷺ, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in this ayah, that when we come across them, respond with peace. It doesn't mean that we have to go in an argument and we have to deal with them for a very long time. No, we just, you know, we come across someone that's not making sense, we're just like, smile at them, let it go, walk away. Does, we don't need to make a big deal out of it, there's no need. Right? And why am I bringing this ayah up? Because in this month of Ramadan, subhanAllah, one of the most essential things that we have to take out of this month is a clean heart and a clean character. And to perfect that character, we have to know how to deal with the people we know and the people that we don't know. A lot of people, a lot of people go into this month expecting the only thing that they're going to come in with and leave out of is hunger that's it and that is the only thing that w some people look at this month as being that it's a fast for 30 days and it's going to be us experiencing hunger and that hunger when we do experience it we have to have a reminder to ourselves when we are experiencing that hunger that that hunger is not just for no reason when we're feeling that hunger we should be feeling what other people around the world are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today we're talking about what 
we should gain out of the month of Ramadan aside to just the hunger. In the beginning of Ramadan, when people are about to go into Ramadan, you'll see people posting on social media, you'll see people going around calling and texting people with this generic message saying that, you know, if I have offended you or disrespected you throughout the year or whatever it is, please forgive me. I want to go in this month clean without any problems with other people, right? Now, that's good. That's a great message to ask someone. But what ends up happening is that people, they, they deliver these messages to people asking them for their forgiveness, kind of, kind of like a get out of jail free card. That, you know, I've been terrible to you throughout the year, but because in this month I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept my fast so I can't have people holding grudges against me. So can you just, you know, forgive me for how I've treated you throughout the year. In this month I'm going to be good. And then after the month, I'm going to go back to how I was treating you. So what is the point of asking for this forgiveness if you and I are not willing to change the way we treat other people? When we ask this forgiveness about the way we've been acting throughout the year, right? We should be going into Ramadan with the intention to make ourselves better, right? And we have to make that a point to the people that we have hurt and harmed. And that is the same thing that happens when people go for Hajj, Umrah. They go, you know, they ask for forgiveness. And that's totally fine. That's an amazing thing to do to ask for forgiveness before embarking on this amazing journey. But we have to be going in with the intention that we're going to actually change ourselves, not just we're trying to just get these people off of our back so that way Allah accepts our hajj or umrah. Right? When we're asking them for forgiveness, we should tell them that, you know, I'm going to be a better person in the future. You don't have to worry about me doing these things or saying these things in the future. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us. That is what this Ramadan is about. That in this month, we should learn how to be a better human being. Right? Because the Prophet ﷺ briefly, in his hadith, he explains that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of someone who just fasts and that's all they get out of it is hunger. Right? Right? There's nothing else that they get out of it. Right? They don't do any type of betterment to themselves, their souls, and they don't do any type of betterment towards their spirituality with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the only thing they get. Right? They just go in the morning, eat, come back in the evening, they eat again and that's it like zombies. That is not the essence of Ramadan. The essence of Ramadan is to spiritually uplift ourselves and to cleanse our character and beautify it so that when we meet people outside of the month of Ramadan, they can see the resemblance of Islam within our character, within our actions. That is the essence of Ramadan. And that is the essence of most of the ibadah that you and I have to do throughout the year that we have to learn how to be better people from that. If we can't treat each other better, if we can't look after each other's rights, then what is the point of what we're doing? That is one of the most essential reasons for why we are fasting in the month of Ramadan. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ, he teaches us that in the month of Ramadan, if somebody quarrels with you, he, tries, he or she tries to start an argument with you, you should just tell them, hey, listen, I'm fasting. I cannot argue with you. That's it. I'm fasting. That's it. Because we in the month of Ramadan, are taught to practice self-restraint, discipline, not just from food and water, but throughout different types of activities that we encounter in our life. Whether it's dealing with ignorant people, whether it's dealing with family members, whether it's dealing with children, whether it's dealing with elders, we're taught in this month how to practice patience that if we can abstain from food and water, something that is a necessity to us, something that we need on a day-to-day -day basis every few hours, if we can abstain from that and we've proven that throughout the month, then we have the ability to mentally and physically restrain ourselves from having anger towards those people that are our family members, that are our companions, that are our friends and our families, to deal with them in a better way. Right? وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying these special people, they walk on this earth so nicely. They walk on this earth with this humbleness, with this peace that they are not better than anyone, with this relaxation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of them. Right? And then when people come across them that are ignorant, they deal with them with salam. Right? That doesn't mean that if somebody is rude to you, somebody does something harmful to you, that you just let them do it. No, it's the way, it's the eloquence and how we stop them from doing it. Right? How do we stop with them? Deal with them with peace. Most of the time, majority of the time, I bet that if we respond in a positive tone with someone who's dealing with us angrily, they will, they will feel like they're foolish and they, will just, they, they won't want to continue acting that way. And if they do, you tell them, 
that hey listen I'm not I'm not here to start a fight I'm not here to do anything you know if you if you want to say what you want to say that's fine that's between you and Allah right I'm not I'm not taking part in this activity of argumentation and then we just move on that's it and that is what we practice in the month of Ramadan as the Prophet Sallallahu teaches us and inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to practice this outside of the month of Ramadan because as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he taught us that the heaviest thing on the day of judgment will be a person's character akhlaq will be a person's upright behavior towards other human beings imagine that he did not say that it will be the amount of salah, the prayer that they prayed, the amount of Qur'an they recited or memorized. It will not be the amount of hadith or the sirah that they learned. Right? It will not just be the raw knowledge that they know. It will be the knowledge that they took and applied into their character. And they practiced. And how they treated other human beings. How they treated other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is the essence of why we are here. That is what our true goal is, to become better human beings to ourselves, to our family members, and to each other. That the heaviest thing on the Day of Judgment will be how we treated other people, our akhlaq. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best of akhlaq, the best of character, the best of manners, and allow us to practice all the good that has been said, and follow the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With that we conclude and say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, we will talk about the significance of the travel writings of Ibn Jubair and his life after this transformative journey. Previously, we learned that this undertaking was not only for the sake of Hajj, but to escape the evil environment of corrupt politics, to turn a new page in his life, and to strive for the forgiveness of Allah. Moreover, this was an opportunity to pursue science, rihla fi talab al ilm and an opportunity to learn deed from the Hijazi scholars. Also, there is some evidence to suggest that his trip may be politically academic, since he spends much of his effort in his book describing the situation of the Muslims in every domain, and describes the military operations of both Muslims and the Christians. After his three-year journey came to a close, he compiled his notes and wrote his rich account of his journey in the third person, in his book he calls the Rihla. Now divorced from the political courts he once led, he devoted his life to teaching and studying hadith and tasawwuf. However, this did not stop the leader of the Al-Mohads, Abu Yusuf Ya'qub Al-Mansur, to have a keen interest in him as his academic prowesses are hard to ignore. Ibn Jubair also wrote poems, some even concerning the great Muslim philosopher Ibn Rushd, also known as Averus. When news reached Ibn Jubair of the return of Jerusalem to the care of the Muslims, he was overjoyed and rushed to perform a second hajj for the immense gratitude to Allah swelling in his heart. Unfortunately for us, his second trip is not really recorded, but we do know it was about four years after he returned from his first trip. Upon his return from his second Hajj, he continued his education in the cities of Malaga and Fez, and became a judge in the great state of Granada. Later on in his life, his wife died, which compelled him to do a third Hajj due to the sorrow he felt. He was 72 years old. On this trip, we know he visited Al-Aqsa, now liberated by Salah al-Din. However, he did not return to Spain and stayed in Alexandria, most likely because Spain was being overrun by foreigners. In Alexandria, he would teach hadith until his death. Ibn Jubair's Rihla calls for a kind of Islamic unity. Berbers in the West, Turks in the East, it doesn't matter, we are all Muslims. All scientific, political, and even religious action should be aimed to restore the lost unity of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not to mention, before his Hajj trip, he was a bit of a nationalist that believed in Andalusian centralization, so this is a major paradigm shift for him. His journey is described as a search for the center of the world, but Ibn Jubair finds that the center of the world is not lost but obscured. The revival of Islam would be found if individuals focused on the unity of the Ummah. Ibn Juzayd, Al-Sharishi, 
Al Abdari, and Al Makrizi all reference Ibn Jubair's work, and explorers like Ibn Battuta were inspired by his writings to embark on their own journeys. Ibn Jubair's work was so great, he was plagiarized many times in history. This style of writing became its own genre, called the Rihla, named after Ibn Jubair's travel chronicles. This genre was actually started by the Andalusian scholar Ibn Arabi from his travel writings. However, this style was made famous by Ibn Jubair. This genre is like a novelization of the journey for knowledge or hajj or any virtuous endeavors like this. A surviving copy of the Rihla is preserved in the Leiden University in the Netherlands. And in fact, it was first published and edited by Westerners. His book now stands as a historical document that accurately depicts the Christians and the Muslims of his time, and first-hand information of the transition of the Fatimid to Ayyubid control of Egypt. His writing style is concise, coupled with Quranic verses and poetry. It provides images of the landscapes, villages, and markets with heavy detail. As a modern reader, it makes us wonder what kinds of dangers a Hajj trip would have posed in his time, from pirates, bad weather, corrupt customs officers, tyrannical governments, there is so much to worry about. This book also describes the cleavage between the Christian and Muslim worlds from warring with each other during the Crusades to being friendly afterwards. One of the themes of this book was also about coexistence with the Christian world as he cites many times the good character and customs of some of the Christians he came across. He also called out some of the evils within Muslim society and politics, making this a very unbiased account of history. If only we knew his target audience, we would have a better interpretation. Fun fact for the kids, in the first Assassin's Creed game, there is a character based on Ibn Jubair. However, his character resembles only his namesake and they utterly ruined his character and his historical relevance in the game. They literally made up everything. Tune in next time to hear about the 17th century explorer, Awliya Chalabi. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على
الله أكبر الله أكبر لا